what you just sang. We are the sons and daughters of God. How awesome is that? We talked about that last week. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? That's, that's the series that we are in. We're talking about who you are. Those of you that are in Christ, there are things that oftentimes you didn't even know came with it. Things that you didn't even know, and that's what we want to investigate for a few weeks because I believe if you understand who you really are, it changes everything. It changes the direction of your life. It changes how you view yourself in the mirror. It changes how you deal with other people and what they may say about you, what they may do to you. It changes everything. And our series is based out of a verse that is very familiar to many of you who, if you were raised in church or you're familiar with the Bible, you know this verse. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And the verse says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And some verses it says you are a new creation. The whole idea is this, your life was changed, but... There's something there that determines that in Christ. As I said last week, I know some of you may not even have made that decision. You're still kind of on the fence about this whole Jesus thing and maybe somebody drug you here. Awesome. Glad you're here. Man, I am so glad you're here. It takes so much courage to walk into a place and and not know what's going to happen. And I'm glad that you're here because you get to hear something directed at those of us that have chosen to follow Jesus. That can be true of your life too. Should you make that decision? So I'm glad you're here, and I hope this is just as impactful for you in understanding Christianity a little bit deeper. For those of us that are in Christ, this should be a challenge to us. This should change our lives. Last week, we spent some time talking about the fact that you may feel insignificant, but no. God, if you are in, if you are in Christ, God makes you who feels insignificant as somebody who is elite. And we talked about, we had a list of all these different things that the Bible says you are. We're going to go another direction today, though. We're going to go another direction. Now, if you're like me, you have stumbled into temptation. You have stumbled. You were tempted to do something. You knew you shouldn't, and you did it. Most of mine involved food. Um, I shouldn't have had that extra Krispy Kreme donut because... I know I'm getting into dangerous turf here. They're better than Dunkin' Donuts. I know. I'm in New England. I, I Go ahead. You can file complaints later. Uh, but uh, I, I shouldn't have had that extra donut. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> I blew my top when I'm driving down the road and someone cut me off. Or I, uh, Have you ever been driving down the road and you had that person that, like, you go to pass them because they're going really slow, and then as soon as you pass them, all of a sudden it's like this great awakening that they decide to speed up, and then they go past you, and then they slow down again. That irritates me. It's a moment of temptation because I want to terrify them. But you give in the temptation and it's frustrating. You had a weak moment. You did something you knew you shouldn't. You thought something would be better than what's best for you. I saw a picture on the internet a little while ago that was a great picture of temptation. That is a bikini. That is Ghirardelli chocolate. This was in a store. Somebody posted this picture that somebody was like, Beach body for the summer? No, chocolate. Here we go. I, I understand. I get it. You give in to temptation. And, and, and temptation is something we wrestle with every day, whether it be small, whether it be large in our life. As a youth pastor for many years, I had the opportunity to counsel students and through temptation issues. And uh, as is not a surprise, I had to counsel a lot of young men in an area of what they were putting before their eyes. And the struggle that they had with things that they would see on the internet or be looking at on the internet. The thing that was interesting to me was whenever they would come and talk to me about it or whenever uh, a parent, you know, found out that they were looking at something they shouldn't be and they brought them to me, I would always ask them how they were feeling. What was the top emotion you figured that they were probably feeling in that moment? Guilt, shame, yep. Mm -hmm. That's what we would think. You know what the number one emotion I heard from them was? Anger. And the reason that they were angry was because they knew better. And they, they wanted to not be doing this, and yet they did it again. And they did it again. And they did it again. And they were angry at themselves. Yes, they felt guilt. Yes, they felt shame. But it was more like, I know this is bad for me. I know this isn't good. But I did it anyway. 
When we give in to temptation habitually, it's, it's bad. And sometimes our habitual sins go even further. Sometimes those habitual sins lead to something known as addiction. Some of you wrestle with addiction in your life. Where it's now not just something that you can turn on and off. Now it's something you're dependent upon. There's a phrase that says, somebody couldn't defeat their demons. Maybe you've used that phrase. Maybe you've heard that phrase. Where a person just can't seem to get past a struggle in their life. Maybe it was an addiction. And they have this great period of being sober. And then one weak moment, they compromise. And the next thing you know, they're right back where they were. As a sports fan, uh, several years ago, there was a baseball player named Josh Hamilton, a man who has made a testimony as a follower of Christ um, on a couple shows. And there's a website that has his testimony. And Josh Hamilton uh, was a man who uh, struggled with alcoholism and drug abuse. And and he really had tried his best to submit his life to Christ, and he was doing well for years. He got a record contract to go play out for the Angels in California. Everything seemed to be on the right path. He, he had taken even the steps of hiring somebody that would travel with him to keep him accountable that he would not mess up because he knew he was potentially weak. Unfortunately, about five years ago, he relapsed. And he fell back into the destructive pattern. And he tried to get back up. And he kept falling. And he kept falling. And now, a, a man who signed a record contract as a baseball player, wh- was one of the best players in baseball, is no longer playing. And nobody really even knows where he is. His demons got to him. He wasn't able to defeat his demons. Now, when you and I are faced with temptation... Obviously, we want to be victorious over it, but too often we either give in or we give up. When faced with temptation, we like to give in or give up. And when we, uh, we do that whenever we feel the temptation is just too, just too strong. I was just too weak, and I had to give in. It was just too much to avoid. I couldn't avoid it. Or I've also heard people when they've given in to temptation say, you know what? It's impossible to beat it, so why try? Here's the white flag. I give in. (laughs) It's too impossible to beat. I'm just in. A friend of mine was a principal at a middle school, and uh, uh, there was a problem within his school with uh, students sexting, sending inappropriate pictures to each other of other students within the school, which is illegal. And one of the main proponents, they brought uh, the son in with his parents And we're confronting, and my friend was confronting him on this whole thing and and laying it before the parents. This is what's happened. This is absolutely unacceptable for our school, et cetera, et cetera. And my friend said this. He was shocked. When he laid it all before the parents, and he asked the dad if he had anything to say, the dad was like, boys will be boys. Not a big deal. And my friend was shocked. What? What? Boys will be boys? You're just going to blow it off like that? Like, eh, he's just doing whatever boys do. Makes you wonder what the dad was doing in his spare time. But anyway, you get the idea. Sometimes we give in or we give up. We just say it's, it's part of who we are, so why even bother fighting, uh, fighting it? No one's perfect. Today, let's talk not so much about temptation, but the mentality that we must have as children of God, as people that say we are in Christ when we are confronted with temptation. I once again make this confession, that this is one of the most powerful things I learned in my life that radically changed who I was and how I viewed myself. My big idea this morning is this, that in Jesus, the dead become the dominant. The dead become the dominant. I'm going to explain this as we go on, as we look at some verses of Scripture. The dead, we know, if you know anything about the Bible, when we become Christians, Before we're a Christian, it says that we are dead in our sin, that we are spiritually dead, obviously not physically dead, but we're spiritually dead. We have a hard time. We cannot really make a connection with God because we are spiritually dead. But we see that in Christ, you're not just alive. It's more than that. You become dominant. You have a position of power. We're going to look at a few verses today 
that I hope stick with you this week and for the rest of your life because they have stuck with me for many years now. And I am, I, I'm so pumped that I get to share this with you. We're going to start today in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 was written by a man named Paul. Paul says this uh, to the people in the church of Ephesus. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he, God, has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Catch this. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. I'm going to go back and look at a little bit of this. Start off, with, and Paul says this, I pray, Church of Ephesus, or for, in our case, Christians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I hope you understand this. I hope you comprehend how deep this is. When you have one of those aha moments, when you realize and discover something really deep, and it's just like everything goes on, he's saying, I hope this happens to you. That you would know, that you would be enlightened, that you would understand the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. We talked about that last week. We said that we are heirs of God, that we inherit his grace and his mercy and his salvation. And his incomparably, you can't even begin to describe it. You can't compare it to anything else in this world. Great power. I can imagine a lot of great power in this world. I see, uh, even as just recently was the anniversary of the atom bomb in Japan and the, the amazing destructive power that human was able to come up with. It says, oh yeah, that, that horrible thing doesn't even compare to God's great power. You can't even compare them. God's power is so much more. This incomparably great power, what's the two words after that? Incomparably for us. Let's try it again. What two words are after that? If you are in Christ, that power is for you. It's in your life. It's accessible to you. Now, I'm not saying they're going to go around and start shooting laser beams out of your hands. That'd be awesome if we could. I would have done that a long time ago. But that spiritual power is available for you. Well, how powerful is it? It says that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted, God exerted, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Pause there. The same power is the same power that raised a dead human being from the dead and made them alive again. How many of you can do that? Exactly. Right answer. We can't. How many human beings can? Zip. Zero. Nada. That power that only God could wield is available to you. It was the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That is a lot of power. That is a lot of spiritual power given to you. It says this, that not only was he raised, but it says that he was seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, at God's right hand, a place of favor. God raised Christ up into the heavenly realms. And that seat that he's sitting in, it's not only God's favor up there, but verse 21 says it's far above rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only now, but forevermore. What does that mean? Well, it means God's power raised and seated Christ in a position of power. And it says that that position is far above all these different rules and authorities and powers and dominions. Now, here's the thing. With those words that are in there, obviously, you know, in the case of Jesus, that's power and dominion here on earth. That his name is above any king, president, ruler that has ever ruled and will ever rule. But it also has a spiritual connotation to it. That means that Jesus has power and authority over the devil. Now, I don't know what you believe about the devil. You may think that's all made up, it's all folklore and all of this stuff. I believe in a very real devil based on God's word. I believe that we have an enemy 
who is looking for a weak moment for you to influence you, not to make you, but to influence you to give in to temptation. I believe you have a spiritual battle you fight every day, even if you don't think you're in a battle. And because you are in a spiritual battle, it's important for you to understand that. I need you to understand a perspective, even if you don't agree with it, because it says that Jesus is above that power and authority and dominion. He's got power over it all to tell what, whatever he wants and to keep it in check. They can't do jack squat about it. He's in charge. This is great stuff. This is great stuff. You have been given this power. You have been given this power. That power is accessible to you. That power is shared with Christ. And that power is guaranteed. So now it's when I really bake your noodle. Okay? That's your head. That's your brain. Because it's great for us to read that and, oh, that's great. I have this wonderful power. Now we go a few verses later in chapter 2. And chapter 2, verses 6 to 7 says this. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show us the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Don't just glaze over this verse. I need you to tie the two verses together. Jesus has been raised and seated at God's right hand above power and authority and dominion. The power of God is available to us, but there's something else here. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him. Okay, so I need you to mentally picture this. Let's say, and I'm not trying to be facetious here. I'm trying to just get the point across. When Jesus was seated in the heavenly realms, there's a love seat in the sky that he gets to sit in and reign from. Or better yet, just a really wide-seated throne. According to Ephesians 2, he's not sitting in that throne alone. Who's sitting there with him? You. You are sitting there with him. Because of what he did, you are sitting with him. Now what was, you know, what's the big deal of Jesus sitting up there? He said he is far above all rule, power, dominion, authority. He has a high position over spiritual powers. So what does that say about you? It says this, you've been given a position too. You've been given authority. You have been given authority. You may not have even realized it. You've been given authority over spiritual powers and darkness and wickedness in your life. Those demons that you can't seem to beat, guess what? You have authority over them. And it's because of what Christ did in him. That's the only way. It's not anything special about us. We have that position of authority in heaven that whatever we say, they need to listen. James 4, 7 is a wonderful verse that I learned when I was a kid. One of my favorite verses, it says this, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he'll think about fleeing from you. Correct? He might flee from you. Maybe if you just pray hard enough, he'll flee from you. No, it says he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God, who gives you the power anyway, and the authority. It came all from him. It's again, has nothing to do with us has everything to do with the extravagant love that he has lavished on us, which we just sang. And now you have this power and authority, and all you have to do is say, Satan, to quote one of our songs, Tom, not today. And he's got to get out of the way. He has to leave you alone. This stuff blew my mind when I began to learn this because I did not realize I had that authority one of the stories I heard to put this in a great perspective for me was uh, I heard the story about uh, down in Central America in, in a small remote village. They had cars there, but they didn't have traffic lights. So the system that they had put into place was a series of booths that were at intersections. And up in the booth would be a man who would be up there who would 
you know, halt traffic, kind of like what we have on the street with construction, would halt traffic, would tell other traffic to go. And he would stand up there. That was his job. And the traffic abided by that. One day, it was, must have been, you know, either they couldn't get child care or it was bring your kid to work day. He had to bring his son. And so his son comes to work with him, and he's up in the booth with him watching his dad, you know, stop traffic, wave traffic through, stop traffic, wave traffic through. Well, the dad had to step away for a second. I don't know, possibly use the bathroom. I have no idea. What do they do there? But anyway, um, he had to step away for a second. And normally they would just let traffic go and figure it out because there was no one obviously available for a few minutes. When the dad came walking back, he had noticed traffic had stopped. He's like, hold on, what's going on? When he gets up to the front of the booth where he stands, his son is standing there imitating what his father does. And all the cars down there, they didn't go, oh, it's a kid, must be his son. Well, let's keep going. No, they stopped. Why? He was in the position of authority. It didn't matter he was a kid. He was in a position of authority, and people respected it, and so it is with you, spiritually. That the authority you are given over spiritual power, it rings true just as much as it does for Jesus. That you have the ability to have power over the, the powers of darkness in our life and the spiritual warfare that we fight every day. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how small you are. If you are in Christ, that's yours. Claim it. Live that. You've been given a power that is stronger than any sin you can imagine. You access that power that we read about in Ephesians 1. You access that power through prayer and submission to God, who is the source of it all. There are times with sin, and maybe it's not even necessarily some of the big sins we know. We lie and cheat and all this stuff. Maybe it's just that you keep demeaning God's creation known as yourself. In prayer, you have the power to overcome, but only in prayer and only in submission to God. Some of us think, you know, if I, I can just beat this sin, if I just try harder, I can beat this temptation if I just try harder, and we rely on our own power and how futile that is. I see too many people thinking that they have the magic uh, pill or the, uh, the silver bullet for the, the struggle in their life. And it's all about them, 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 them. And it's not claiming the power given to you by God. But not only do you have this power that's stronger than sin, you have a position over our enemy. Don't take that lightly. You have a position over our enemy. You have no need to listen to him anymore and what he tells you about you. Or what, I should say, he tries to remind you about you and your past and who you were. Because that's not who you were anymore. You're a new creation. You've been given a new start, a clean slate. And he is going to try to remind you, well, you messed up before. (laughs) He tries to kill you with guilt and struggle and wrestle you back down to the ground. And, And because of our position of power, but our position of authority because of Christ... You do not have to listen to him anymore. You have the right to tell him to leave you, and guess what? He must. He must. Now, don't think that once you tell him, get away, one time, that he's like, oh, well, I guess I can't bother them anymore. I'm done. No, because the Bible tells us that he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for those weak moments. But you have to be conscious of those weak moments and get your battle plan together to be able to tell him it again so that you can overcome it again and put him in his place again because the position's below you. Now, uh, I'm going to go a direction with this. Um, There are some people that think, well, this gives me the full right that I can just, you know, demean Satan and just not have any respect for him and diss him. Wrong. You may have authority over him, but you are wise to respect your enemy because when you don't respect your enemy, they catch you off guard. In fact, when you don't respect them, they may pay a little bit more attention to you to remind you that they do 
have the ability to make you stumble and fall. Um, we're now three weeks away from football season, uh, college football, which I know not all of you watch, but my wife and I do. Uh, and it always cracks me up. College, it's more lopsided than in professional football. You have uh, like a really good school like in Alabama or in Ohio State, the teams I can't stand, but my son keeps saying that he's a fan of now, and I'm praying the sin out of him. Um, anyway, uh, the, he's, he's a fan of the, uh, or, you know, you got these big teams, and always the first few weeks of the season, they play these, like, nobody schools, like Bob's Tech, you know, from wherever in the middle of nowhere, and they have, like, they barely got a football team together. Now you see this matchup, and all of you are like, well, there's a 70-point win right there. But what's funny about this is the interviews with the coaches before these games. Because they interview the coach, and we'll say Nick Saban from Alabama, their coach who, they'll interview him, and what do you think about Bob's Tech? Wow, they got a pretty good team together. Man, they, their defense has been pretty good from what I've heard. They got this player who's really good, and it, everybody knows he's going to win by 70 points. But he goes and he's showing them respect when you're going to trounce them? Because he knows that if he goes in with this arrogant spirit of, well, 70 points, let's see if we can score 75. And when everybody thinks the game's over before it even began, that he's even more prone to defeat than if he goes in and prepares his people to say, this is a good school that we got to play. We can't do that with the devil. Because when we do, we're prone to fall. So I have a few pushbacks on this. I was thinking through, as I was going through this passage, what might people be thinking in response to this? Here's one. Does this mean I can overcome addiction? What, uh, does this mean that all of a sudden I can overcome any addiction that I ever have? Yes and no. Yes and no. And I hate to give you two answers, but yes, this helps. Yes, this is true. And there are areas of addiction that this helps when you begin to see who you are in Christ and when you understand the spiritual part of this. But there are cases of addiction where you need more help, where you do need counseling, where you do need somebody in your life. I'm not going to discredit that at all. So yes and no. This helps you see your identity in Christ and the, the power and authority that you have over the evil one who's making you stumble, uh, stumble in that. But sometimes we need a little bit more holistic help to deal with the things that are practical and real. How about another pushback? So all I have to do, Dan, is pray and everything's good. Yes and no. <laughs> yes, you should be praying. Yes, you should be submitting to God. Yes, prayer is how God gives us the right perspective on the sin and the temptation that we're struggling with and how much better a life he has for us if we would just overcome this. But no, you still have to take proactive steps. It's not just, well, I prayed that I'd overcome fighting uh, with, with my spouse all the time and demeaning them. I prayed. Nothing happened. Did you take any steps towards defeating that? What did you do? What was your battle plan? You can't just do the prayer as a magic pill that makes everything right because sometimes we have to put a little effort in on our side and not just expect God to do all the heavy lifting. He can, <laughs> but sometimes he expects it of us to be living a certain way. One last pushback. Dan, I already tried this, and it didn't work. My response to that, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Keep persevering. I don't mean to just blow that off, uh, but sometimes I think we try it like one time, and it doesn't work, and then two times, and then we're like, okay, that didn't work. What's the next thing? When sometimes it takes perseverance. It takes perseverance. It, it, it sometimes it's in those constant battles with this, you begin to learn more, and God begins to speak to you more and reveal more. Persevere. I know one thing, your enemy's going to persevere. He's not giving up anytime soon. He won't give up till you take your last breath. Because I'll tell you, if you're in Christ, he does not like you. He's not your friend. So why would he give up? Better yet, why should you give up? I s this is a passionate word from God for me today because I'm tired of seeing Christians who have power that raised a man from the dead 
and have authority because of him. I'm tired of seeing people with all of that available to them and accessible to them, and they live a defeated life. You have the position and you have the power and you do nothing with it. You forget that the battle was won. And you live like you're a loser. And it's a losing cause. I'll never forget in college, I had a teacher, uh, Psychology 101, worst class ever. I cannot stand Psychology 101. But uh, I had a teacher, her name was Barrett Foz. She was from, I think, Sweden or Norway, one of them. And, and Barrett Foz uh, was a sweet lady but she was no match for freshmen. We had about 100 of us, 150 of us in the class, and as she would be up front teaching us about, you know, all the dude, whatever it was that got the, like, spike through his head and he had this personality change and all the stuff you learn in psychology 101, crazy stuff. Uh, as she's up there teaching, no one is paying attention to her. Zero. There's people talking, like, verbally, out loud, Normal volume all over the classroom. People drawing, people sleeping, not paying any attention to Dr. Foz. I unfortunately was one of those. But uh, here's my point. I see too many Christians living that way. Dr. Foz was in a position of authority as a teacher. She didn't own that authority. She didn't put her foot down and say, I will not tolerate this. And that is what I see in too many Christians living a defeated, powerless life when they have all the power they need and all the authority they will ever need. And my final thought's this. If this is true, if all of this is true today about your identity, activate your God-given authority. Begin to live in that authority. Begin to understand how deep that touches areas of your life. One of my favorite movies, Lord of the Rings, there's a great moment where after time and time again, the main character, Aragorn, well, one of the main characters, Aragorn, uh, Aragorn has been running from his destiny of being a king. And Elrond comes up to him, and he says something to him that sticks with me. He says, become who you were born to be. Become who you were born to be. And in that moment, Aragorn changes. And he begins to live with what he was born to be, the king. So I leave you with this. Be who you were made to be. Be who you were made to be this week as an authority over spiritual darkness in your life. As one who's been given power to overcome sin and temptation because of what Jesus did, not because of what we can do. Let's pray. Father, uh, there are people here I know that are probably still just investigating you and even if they believe this. And Lord, even today I ask that you would help them to clearly see that you love them, that they have a desperate need for you, and that today would be the day that they say, I will follow Jesus the rest of my days and turn from living a life of sin. I want to follow him. Lord, for the rest of us that have been living life defeated, powerless, beaten into the ground, maybe it's our self-image. Maybe it's temptation with things we say, we do, we watch. Lord, maybe it's so much as an addiction that what we hear today is not just these really cool verses that make me feel good, but Lord, that this becomes who we are because it is who we are, that we begin to live the identity you gave us and be who you made us. And Lord, may it radically, radically change the rest of our lives when we live in this. Lord, I know the enemy doesn't like what's being taught today because it reminds him of his position and that he doesn't have one over us. And so, Lord, I ask for protection from his attacks today, that you would help us to be aware and to overcome it by the authority you've given us as we are co-seated spiritually with you in the heavens over him. Give us powerful lives. And we ask this in the name of Jesus.